All right. So in situ disease treatments for stony coral tissue loss disease. So this will have a couple of parts. One, I just want to give you a, a brief outline of what has been tried, what has worked, a little bit about use of antibiotics in the environment. And uh, then we will do some specific training on lesion identification. Now that has some interactive component. I'm not sure how it will work with this, but we'll give it a try. And then we will we will finish this off with um, I will present some research of other people that you guys need to keep in mind as you go down this path of trying to um, reduce the mortality from disease from you guys. So what have people in all the different regions in Florida, Virgin Islands, elsewhere, what have they been trying? Well, we have the antibiotic paste down here that has now been developed. Some people have covered their antibiotic paste with a clay patch, and that is to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are released into the environment. So it's keeping the medicine next to the coral and keeping it from being released elsewhere where it shouldn't be. We've tried, to, uh, people have tried chlorinated epoxy, so marine epoxy with chlorine powders mixed in and placed right on the lesions. People have done trenching or fire breaks. So if the lesion is here, they've uh, used a saw to cut a break the tissue line here. And the idea being if this treatment doesn't work and the disease gets passed, by the time it gets to this line, this coral under here or the trenching will be dead and the disease will be stopped. Exact same with a fire break when you're trying to control that. Um, essential oils have been tried. Apparently they're a little hard on corals, so that didn't work too well. Um, hydrogen peroxide has been tried. Um, chlorinated cocoa butter is what we've tried um, in Turks and Caicos. And probiotics have been tried here. And probiotics is where this is Blake's work. He has actually grown uh, beneficial bacteria that he has found growing naturally on the corals in Florida. So this is bacteria from healthy corals that produce their own antimicrobial activity. And so he is able to inoculate corals with this and cause the disease to either to stop in, in the lab, he, it will actually stop the disease and prevent it from being transmitted. And he's now trialing it in the field where he's um, tinting these corals and injecting that good bacteria in there and leaving it on for multiple hours and then taking off to see if it works. So these are all the, the different methods that are being trialed there. So the one question people ask is, well, antibiotic treatment works pretty good. Why don't you, why are you trying all these other different methods? Why is everybody doing all this? Why not just do antibiotics? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, the success varies by species and by colony. It's not quite that simple. It's very successful on some species and less so on others. It does require repeated treatments to stop the disease. So this is not a put it on there once and walk away. It's, it's a put it on there once, go back in a couple weeks, retreat, go back in a month, retreat. So it's not a panacea for all. And when you use antibiotics in the environment, you do have the risk of developing or creating a situation where antibiotic resistant bacteria are now um, becoming more abundant in your environment. And that's not good for the corals and that's not good for the divers in that environment as well or any of the other living organisms. So if we could find an alter alternate method, that would be better. So stony coral tissue loss disease is a devastating disease for sure. It needs to be addressed, but if we could find a way to treat these lesions with probiotics, disinfectants or ana antiseptics instead of antibiotics, it would be a much safer alternative. So to definition, disinfectant is something that will kill bacterial pathogen or, or viruses um, on a surface. You'd, you'd use Clorox to clean a surface. Antiseptics is, would be something that you would clean it on a living organ, like our skin. We use iodine or hydrogen peroxide to kill uh, pathogens on our skin. So that is why we're looking into alternative methods. And um, that is the approach 
that they are taking for disease management in the Turks and Caicos. And for all you people that are going to volunteer to help body in the department there, thank you, thank you, thank you. They, it takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of help, and the reefs, this really needs to be jumped on as quickly as possible. And we have in the works multiple new treatment methods that we're trying um, to see if we can address both the problem of the disease and the problem of not putting more antibiotics into our near shore environment where we humans are. So step two is now training you on how to properly identify and describe coral lesions. And this will be a general one, and I hope you'll take this information. And any, all you guys that are divers, every time you go out on the reef, be looking for this stuff. And if you find anything interesting, feel, please feel free to photograph it and send it my way. So how do we identify coral disease when we go in the field? Well, disease in corals has three manifestations. Either the tissue loss is sloughed, here's the healthy brown, and once the tissue loss is gone, like in this region, you have sediment coming in, you have algae coming in, and that will give you some indication of how quickly it's done. You can have discolorations, such as this purple spot here, this is the healthy tissue, or corals actually also get these tumors or growth anomalies as shown here. So when we look to identify disease, we first look at the type of lesion that we notice on a coral, and then we have to do sort of a field investigation to discriminate between disease and other things that might create, say, tissue loss. It's not just going to be disease. And then I'll teach you how to describe the lesion and then the proper way to talk about these lesions, so disease nomenclature. So we know there are three types. How do you discriminate between disease and other biological factors? So we'll take an example of a lesion that's a color change. It could be disease or it could be competition, it could be abrasion, it could be invertebrate burrows, it could be a number of things that create a, a color change. So here's two corals, colonies, they both have weird colors. That darker color, that's the color the coral should be. What is all this light stuff? And it's not bleaching, so that was confusing. And this is the normal color. What are all these multifocal, blotchy, dark things? So we don't know, we have to look at these lesions and think about all these different factors. So for example, here's a lighter spot right here. It has this arched uh, shape here. And on this, this was in Florida. All I did was step back and I watched this lesion a moment. And what did I see? I saw the algae brushing up against this colony back and forth with the water motion. So I could say, oh, this is algal abrasion that's causing this change in the coral. Done. Not disease. Don't need to worry about it. You see competition among both uh, between and within coral species. So these lines, this mucus, have nothing to do with disease. This is where one colony, they actually evert sweeper tentacles out of their mouth, reach over, and sting their neighbors because they're fighting for space on the reef. So we know what that looks like. Done. Not worrying about disease here. Here you have a coral, you have all these little, almost look like little tumors all over it. But if you look at this little closely, you can see there's little openings on all of these guys. And so what this actually is, is invertebrate burrows. So these are like little clams or worms um, that burrow into the coral skeleton. And that opening, uh, opening is how they are able to breathe and take in food. So we know that, not a disease, done. In this case, we didn't figure this out until we had done histology on these two. And when we did do this histology, we found this was normal. Mucus sheathing had nothing to do with disease. This, these healthy coral was just popping out mucus and was gonna slough it off. But in this case, these dark spots are caused by a fungal infection in the tissue. And there you have it. Now, normally what you'd see a lesion or discoloration would be white. Now, just because you see white on the colon doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean it's disease. It could be either bleaching or it could be bare skeleton. Now, if it's bleaching, that means that the polyps, as you can see, are still there, but the symbiotic algae or zooxanthellae have 
uh, left the tissue. You can see the zooxanthellae are still here, giving the polyps its traditional brown color. But there's no color in any of these. You can see that, but it's still alive. That's bleaching, okay? So when you see white, the first thing you need to do, is it bleaching or is it actual tissue loss? So you look for evidence in polyps. If it is bare skeleton, again, it could be predation. It doesn't necessarily mean it's disease. These are white spots there, there, there. What is it? Well, you got to rule this out. Is it predation? Is there a predator present? Look at that pattern of tissue loss. Does that indicate a predator or a disease process? And is there any evidence that the tissue loss is progressive? So these are the three most common predators you would see um, on your reefs there in the Caribbean. You have snail predators that will feed on coral. You have different types of fish predators that will feed on coral. And of course you have your fireworm that will feed on the coral. So you need to know what those predation scars look like in order to discriminate between a disease, a tissue loss due to disease versus tissue loss due to these predators there. So for Corallophilia, the snails, one thing you look for, if it was a crop where you see this scalloped edges, because they, they tend to cluster there in these patterns as they go forth. In other corals, they tend to hide in the crevices and kind of feed their way out. So they don't climb over healthy tissue and then stop and feed here. You wouldn't expect to see a spot of a coral feeding here and all this healthy here. So you can start to think about could this be a feeding scar or not? Does that not make sense? Of the fish, you guys have parrotfish out there that not only pick out the coral, but it scrapes the coral skeleton. You can see the scrapes because they're called parrotfish because they're, they're, they have a very hard uh, uh, mouth that, that scrapes. And frequently you'll see it with this double-sided thing. It's like they have a gap in their mouth there. And they also do this focal parrotfish predation, okay? So this is not just tissue loss, but you can see the skeleton is scraped. So somebody that didn't know about parrotfish predation might see that and go, oh, a cute disease, oh my goodness. No, the skeleton is gone, it's parrotfish predation. So you need to know that when you go out in the field and you're picking colonies to treat and you're interpreting your lesions, this is the kind of information you need. For the damselfish, they don't scrape it like those parrotfish, but you see they pick, pick at it and they'll leave this multifocal little spots in little chimneys for algae, and they'll actually clean some sections of the tissue out. So this would be very um, uh, consistent with these uh, damselfish feeding on the corals, nothing to do with disease. Now the fireworms, they prefer acroporas, and they prefer to eat the tips of acropora. So if you saw a tip of an acropora with the tissue gone, it'd probably be these fireworms. But a lot of the acroporids are gone now, they're dead. And so they are starting to feed on non-preferred prey. And as you can see, they actually go up and feed on the diseased lesion. So this is uh, a, the boulder coral, and you can see tissue's been sloughing, but slowly in this di very distinct bleached border for that subacute, and that fire worm is, is just chowing down. So we do wonder if this uh, fire worm might be spreading this disease within a reef. Is it feeding on this disease? lesion and then going to a healthy colony and feeding on that and the disease being transferred um, through its mouth parts? I don't know, but it's something that we need to, to look at. Um, this would be typical of a cot's predation. That's the crown of thorns sea stars. You guys don't have them there, but just as an example, they climb onto uh, corals, they avert their stomach, and they uh, uh, digest the tissue to absorb it, but very indicative for this, we know that they can't get their stomach all the way down into the branches. So you just look to see if there's residual tissue down there, and then you know that that's a cost predation. Also, you don't see any evidence of progression. All of the tissue is bright white that disappeared all at once. In this case, what we see is a linear pattern of white, so recent tissue loss, and then we see an area where there's some algae and then greater algae. So that would indicate that the disease started here and then progressed in this direction because the longer the tissue's gone, the more algae is going to grow on it. 
So this would be more indicative of a disease process. And think about, is there a predator that would make this linear uh, semicircular pattern? Not likely. So that combined with the disease progression, you're pretty sure that that's a disease process. Here's another example. Bright white, where this Acropora, this is American Samoa, just recently sloughed the tissue. Little bit of yellow, where the endolith, ick algae is growing in and um, filamentous just starting to come in. Algae gets thicker, thicker, thicker. So this disease started in this region and has been progressing in this fashion. So that evidence of progressive tissue loss based on the degree of algal uh, colonization. So this was in the Philippines. This is an acroporid, and I saw the bright white. I saw the green, so algae that looked like progression to me from here to there. But when I, uh, I was uh, snorkeling, when I dove down to take a closer look, lo and behold, I see snails chowing down. This was drapellid snail predation that, that mimicked um, disease, but if you take a close look and you look for the snails, well, there you find your culprit right there. So easy to discriminate. So if you see white on coral, first determine whether it's bleaching, polyps present, or bare skeleton. If it's bare skeleton, then you need to discriminate between a predator or potential disease. You do that by looking at these factors and sometimes you do need to do the, the follow-up lab st studies to be positive. Growth anomalies or tumors are the easiest. They're usually pretty obvious. They're usually protuberant, paler in color, and they're, the structure of the skeleton is usually much different than, than normal. But if you do see any growth anomalies, please photograph them and send them my way because growth anomalies are pretty common in the Indo-Pacific. They're pretty common in the middle, um, Persian Gulf and very rare in the Caribbean that I've seen. So I'm very curious about why that would be because they're all corals all over the world. Okay, so you found your lesion, you're pretty sure it's disease, now how do you describe it? So first off you tell, you, you, you um, note what host is affected, so what type of coral is, effect, is affected. And then if it is a tissue loss uh, disease, you want to give an indication of how fast it is losing that disease. Is it slow, say less than one centimeter of bright white? Is it subacute, maybe one to five centimeters of bright white bare skeleton? Or is it acute, really fast, greater than five centimeters um, of bare skeleton? So this would be an example of chronic. So you guys have this yellow band there in the Caribbean. And this has a lot of algae growth. So this is killing this colony, but very, very slowly um, there. Subacute would be this that we were studying in Fort Lauderdale. And then the acute, you see there's no algal colonization at all. This is all bright white, and that's an acute uh, tissue loss disease. Now, the reason we focus on um, that rate of tissue loss is because they can actually indicate different diseases. This is a Montipora rice coral in Hawaii, same species, just different growth forms, both in Kaneohe Bay off the island of Oahu in Hawaii. We were studying this disease. We would call this Montipora. That's the host tissue loss disease for both of them. But when we did focal studies on both these types of diseases, we found that this was a slow all year round, just slow tissue loss disease. This is very fast. This is a much larger amount of white skeletal tissue. This is found chronically year round. This only breaks out, has outbreaks in the winter when it's rainy and cold and in, um, lots of runoff. So some people in the waiting room, it says there, who's ever taken care of that. This was found to be caused by a bacterial pathogen called Vibrio NCI, and this has different bacteria um, that create this acute tissue loss. So those actually are two different diseases, even though they're on the same host in the same bay, different diseases. So that's why we like uh, need to, to record the rate of tissue loss. Then you can describe the lesion, whether it's discoloration, tumors, or tissue loss, is it focal, one spot, multifocal, these pink spots, 
There's a bunch of them, so this would be multifocal. This is a trematode infection, or is it spots that seem to be growing into each other, kind of lurching together? That would be coalescing. Where on the colony is it? Edges only, middle, all over. What about the lesion margin? Is it fragmented? You can see how this tissue is just kind of fragmenting off on this lesion edge, where this isn't fragmenting, it's actually peeling back along the lesion edge. Um, so, for example, you look at the colony here. From afar, you see brown, you see white. You look up close, there's no bleaching edge. It's just tissue loss right up to the, the very uh, brown polyps. Same thing, brown, losing tissue, but here we see these bleaching polyp edges. These are important things to note and to photograph too. Lots and lots of pictures, please, lots of pictures. And then disease nomenclature. What do you call these diseases or lesions that you're seeing in the field? Well, I don't know if you're aware of it, but we have a Coral Disease and Health Consortium. So this is developed by a whole group of different types of biologists, so coral biologists, microbiologists, histopathologists that came together to try and come up with some consistent uh, methods for investigating coral disease. And they recognized the need for standardized nomenclature because it was getting very confusing with everybody calling disease something different. And they said, describe the lesion in general terms based on that visual appearance, tissue loss. Why call it white? White could be bleaching. <laughs> so just drop the confusion and call it what it is. So in this case, this is parietes. It's got a growth anomaly. Name of the disease, parietes growth anomaly. We, don't, we didn't see the tumors on any other coral species. This, platygyra, it's a type of brain coral out here. It's got subacute tissue loss. We didn't see it on other species, so we're not going to call it a general tissue loss disease. It affected only platygyra. So if you do hear the word white syndrome, because that is in the literature, that just means a tissue loss disease of unknown etiology. Don't know what's causing it, but we know it's a disease. Okay, so put that in your brain for future reference. So in Florida, what we found was a case where it's tissue loss disease, but it's not just one species like that platygyra one. It's affecting multiple species. So if we follow the same nomenclature, that is where we came up with the name stony coral because it did not affect any of the soft corals or the sea bands, tissue loss disease. So that's where that came from. No confusion. So um, diseases um, cannot be diagnosed in the field unless it is either black band disease where you can see the filamentous cyanobacteria right there or the ciliate disease, where you can actually see the little ciliates in the lesions. These are the only two diseases there in um, the Caribbean that can be diagnosed. Diseases that cannot be diagnosed are the tissue loss diseases. Just because these are both losing tissue does not mean they're caused by the same pathogen. It's just like the, the slow and the fast tissue loss disease in Kaneohe Bay on Montipura. They were different diseases. Same coral species, same place, different rate of tissue loss, different diseases. So they cannot be diagnosed without a test. The same if you get a very bad sore throat, you don't go to the doctor. He looks in your throat and says, oh, you've got strep throat. No. He looks in your throat, sees you have a very bad sore throat, and he swabs it, and he tests that swab to see if it has a streptococcus uh, bacteria that causes strep throat. And he does not call it strep throat until he has a final diagnosis, and we are doing the exact same methods um, in studying diseases in coral. Um, in terms of disease nomenclature, especially there in the Florida region, there has been a lot of confusion. For example, they came up with white band disease. Okay, it's band-like, it's white, is it bleaching, is it tissue loss? We don't know. Um, I mean, the name doesn't tell you, but it was found to affect acroporas. And there was white plague found to affect other uh, species. And they found a specific pathogen there. They had white pots that only uh, affected elk horn. They found a specific pathogen. They found yellow band. Um, they found specific uh, pathogens, um, but only affecting these mounding corals. So this created a lot of confusion. Um, 
for people trying to work on these. So, and if you continue your studies, like K Katie Patterson was the one that determined the pathogen that created white pox. But then she continues to study and later on down the, the, the uh, years later, she finds that actually this same Elkhorn coral can get the same disease signs with a different pathogen. So even in one where we did know the pathogen, we find out it's not always that pathogen. So if you were gonna do proper nomenclature for these, you would say white band affects the croppers only and it creates subacute tissue loss disease. Then you're not assigning any specific pathogen. White plague, it was an acute tissue loss disease and we don't put a name there because it's multiple species. White pox was specifically for a cropper of palmata and it produced multifocal subacute tissue loss. See, if you, if you name it like this, there's nothing to be misinterpreted. You know who, you know what it looks like. Yellow band was a specific type of coral and it produces a very slow tissue loss. So, so that is how all of the information you need to identify, go in the field with Roddy and start being able to properly re recognize diseases. So this is a part that would have worked much better had I been able to see you, but let's just give it a try. And maybe I'll call on some people um, that I know then turn their video on for me. So I'm gonna put a picture up of a lesion. And the first thing I want you to decide is, is it a tissue loss lesion? Is it a tumor? Or is it some weird coloration? It's yellow or purple or pink. It's something the coral shouldn't be colored. After you've made that decision, I want you to then, then think about everything I just yapped at you, talk, 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 and decide, could that be um, a disease or a biological interaction? Is it predation? Is it uh, algal irritation? Or could it be disease? <clears throat> if it is a tissue loss lesion, I want you to try and figure out, based on degree of algal colonization or sedimentation, how fast that coral is dying, and then what is the pattern, okay? So we'll do a couple and walk through it. So here's your healthy coral, there's your lesion, here's your cube. What type of lesion is it? That's your first question. Based on what you see here, the pattern of infection, uh, or a pattern of tissue loss, et cetera, et cetera, then I want you to decide, could it be biological or is it disease? Then I want you to think, okay, if it's tissue loss, how fast is it? And how would I describe it? So there's four things that I want you thinking about. So take a look at that picture. And in a minute, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to call on someone. Actually, I'm going to call on Roddy <laughs> to answer these questions. All right. Roddy, are you there? Yep, yeah, I'm here. Turn on your video, please, so I have a face to look at. Um, I don't think I can give you a face. Let's see what we... No face? Usually Let me see. Let me see. There should be a turn camera off and on there. I've turned it on. Are you seeing me at all? I don't I think see... my camera works very well. I see a blue thing. Well, that's a little better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware I'm here. <laughs> okay, Roddy, what do you think? What type of lesion was that? Um, so I'll say <laughs> that this is a tissue loss. Very good. Uh, so we're seeing the white skeleton exposed. We're not seeing any um, kind of pale or anything. We're not seeing the actual polyp tissues there. Very good. Very good. Um, so we're saying that's tissue loss. Good. Um, I will move past um, the disease or biological interaction for now. I'm not going to make a, a 
a judgment on that first. I'll move on to whether it's acute, subacute, or chronic. Okay, uh, and let me, let me give you a bit of information. Each polyp calyx on Montastria is about one centimeter. Right. Just FYI. Yes. Um, so I would call that a uh, subacute. Very good. Um, just because it's not more than five centimeters so much. We're starting to see um, some algal growth um, on the tissue uh, or the skeleton there. Um, focal, multifocal, or coalescing. Um, from this angle, it looks like it's focal. Um, we might want to have a, a look around the rest of the colony to see um, there. whether there's other spots going on. Very good. Um, and then is it disease or is it biological interaction? Mm -hmm. um, so looking at this colony, we can see that there has been some older mortality um, with some algal growth growing on that. I would want to have a look around um, the colony itself and some of the adjacent crevices to see if we see some kind of potential predators that are in the area. Mm -hmm. um, but just based on that information of what we're seeing there, it's possible that it's a disease. Okay, so Roddy just brought up some good things when he said, well, I'd really need to take a look around. I'd need to look for snails. I'd need to look um, other, other colonies nearby. Do other colonies have a similar lesion like this? So what he is taking, <laughs> make me so proud, Roddy, <laughs> is he is taking the investigative approach to understanding a, a, a coral lesion, okay? So he doesn't just look and stop thinking. He's now starting to say, hmm, I need more information, and that is very good. That's exactly what you should be doing. So I'm gonna pop back on. Okay, so now in terms of whether it's disease or not, this was a super tricky one. It confused me for everything that uh, Roddy just said, but what, why I was hesitating to call it disease is we see this very firm margin here um, that usually if it was disease, this should be either fragmented or peeling or something. And it almost kind of looked like this was starting to heal. So I was pretty confused by this. It didn't quite look like disease to me. And so in swimming around, what I found as I backed off away from it is when I got out of the way, this damselfish very quickly came into his territory. So he had picked all of that tissue out and it just took me backing off for him to go back in there. So this was actually fish predation. Now, why, why did he clear that out? So I'm looking around going, asking myself that question when I came across this. This is a fish nest. So these damselfish were actually clearing out and notice it's low on the side so that they could protect it better clearing out this set area of tissue to lay their eggs on it. So there you go. All right, let's go on to the next one. And Masa, I'm going to ask you about this one, so be ready, okay? Okay, so we see normal brown. We see this white. Again, first off, tissue loss, growth anomaly, discoloration. So you might say, I can't tell whether that white, if there's polyps there or not, Greta. So, of course, I'll give you a close-up. There's your close-up. Is it disease or biological? And then the descriptors. So take a look. Think about those factors. Hi, Greta. Uh, sign of uh, this core is so weird, but I don't see any progression rate. Uh, you know, I don't see any sign of um, algae. That's right. Growth. Very good. Very good. So, first off, what type of lesion is this? 
and it's so weird because it this the the white uh, in the side of colony. So, mm. do you do you see polyps in there in that white? Uh, the picture is not. Yeah, clear, picture might not be good enough. So I'm going to help you with that one just because you would be able to if you're there. The polyps are there. The polyps are uh, okay. So, um, I um, give me a moment. Um, if the polyp is there, maybe. Mm. So if the polyp are I, there, is there, and the, the zooxanthellae are gone, what is that called? Maybe it's focal, multifocal bleaching, but... Very good, very good. So you've already got oh, bleaching, well, which is a discoloration. You've got multifocal, yeah. it's all over, maybe even coalescing. Okay, what do you think? Is that disease or biological interaction? Maybe biological interaction. What are you seeing you know, in that picture that could be creating that pattern? Nothing. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, there's nothing there. So it's, it could be a kind of um, disease, maybe discoloration disease. Mm -hmm. Very good. Multifocal, so, um, multifocal, yeah, pattern. In, 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 uh, Masa got it there. One of the things that she cued on to was that the bleaching was on the side of the colony. If this was bleaching due to UV stress or heat stress, you, you, you'd expect to see the top of the colony bleaching. But this oh. is not so. It's the side. And so the, the colony shouldn't be yeah. bleaching. There's no algae here. There's no soft corals. The soft corals over here. If there had been soft corals brushing, or something, anything. I mean, you definitely want to look around and see if there's anything brushing against this colony. But if you see absolutely nothing, then you would say the host, which you wouldn't know, Masa, because this is Caribbean, but Sidastria. And then I would say diffuse because it's all over non-thermal bleaching, because we know it's not thermal. Okay, so that would be the nomenclature. Very good, thank you, Masa. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go on to the next one. This one's a little easier. I'm going to be asking, uh, um, who should I ask? It'll be, a, it'll be a surprise. So again, the arrow is pointing at the lesion. This is a parietes. Type of lesion. Is it disease or biological? And then descriptors. Brian E. You're up. I'll, I'll turn on my camera. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, so. Okay. Do you want me to put the picture back up? Do you need to look at it a little more? No, I, I can see I can see it. It's just a little bit small, so that's why I'm peering. <laughs> um, Type so, of so, sorry, what did you say? Type of le what type of lesion is it? Is it tissue loss? No. no. If it were tissue loss? No, these are good questions. And so normally I would have you talking to each other and notice I'm putting people on the spot that I know that I know. So um, these are all good questions. And every time you make a, a wrong guess, someone else learns from it. So that's why I'm picking on you. If it were tissue loss, the skeleton would be white. OK. So that's that's what you'd cue on to. You'd say, okay, something's weird there, but it's not white, so it's not bleaching and it's not tissue loss. Okay. So yep. your other two choices are growth anomaly or some other discoloration. So d where it's pointing, is that tissue colored any different than the rest of the colony? Yeah, it looks a little lighter and and less. Yep, and less fluffy. Yes. 
technical words. Yes, less fluffy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the shape looks a little different. So that is that a growth an anomaly? So that's that's very good interpretation there. Okay. So the shape looks a little different. The color's a little bit paler, which is very common in growth anomalies. Because you're correct, it is a growth anomaly. Okay, now we'll go with the descriptor. Is that focal or multifocal? Um, it's focal because it's good. one place. Very good, very good. Okay, and you can see the outline here of this. And as she said, it's, it's much, the shape is different and this is more wrinkly, right? This is fluffier and this is smoothed out. So this is actually a parietes growth anomaly and it is focal. Okay, see that, how it's distinct? All right, we'll go on to the next one. Jane, are you still on the line? Because if so, it's gonna be- I you. am, I keep dropping out, Bretta. I've, <laughs> I've just been thrown out three times in the last 10 minutes, so you might be better off picking on somebody else. <laughs> no, I'm picking on you. This okay, one. I'll give it a go while I'm, if I can stay online. <laughs> This one's actually a mean one, so I had to give it to you. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Gosh. Okay. Let me have a go. All right. Yes, it's not the. This is normal. It's not the greatest of pictures, is it? Um, About a set. Okay. I would say that it's not a growth anomaly. Okay. It's obviously got some. It's obviously discolored, but, okay. but. I can't see the edge of the the um, you know the demarcation between the brown and the the um, grey very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Even that's a bit small for my eyesight, but I'll give it a go. Um, I would say there's a good chance that that is tissue loss. So it's not, and you can't tell it from this okay. picture. So I'm going to give you that. Um, it's okay. not. It's not tissue loss. <laughs> Um, okay. If it's not tissue loss, then it's going to be. Water, you'd see it. You'd see it. But okay, go ahead. Uh, then it is obviously discoloration. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, um, well, it's on the top of the colony, so it could be bleaching. And I'll but it's a bit of a weird, weird. Um, sort of zigzag it's got on the interface there, which do, isn't consistent with bleaching for me, and the rest of the colony is also covered up. Right. So you're picking up exactly what you're thinking about, the zigzag that doesn't make sense with bleaching, the, yeah. the top of the colony is brown, that doesn't make sense with bleaching, you're right, it's not bleaching. So yeah, it so, but it is a discoloration, so it does make yep. me think that um, it's possibly a disease of some description. Um, because I can't see any obvious reason for it to be a biological interaction. Very I can't good. see any, you know, I can't see any algae brushing against it. There are no obvious fish in the area. Uh, although you could be tricking me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would say that it is a disease. Um, and I would say it's probably subacute. Although I can't tell whether that's got algae on it. Um, is it possible that it's acute? Um, and it looks to me like it's got a front to it. So that zigzag edge is progressing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. And I picked on you because I knew you would, you're a little more advanced. So everything she was thinking and saying was exactly right. As she went through the process of elimination, it couldn't be this. It's not that. In reality, Jane, what this is, is it's uh, mucus sheets. Oh, it's okay. We didn't actually pick up on this until we did histology on some corals in American Samoa. And then I started developing the eye for it. But if you look at, if you, you can't, but if you zoomed in, you see where my arrow's pointing right there? Uh, no. Yeah. No, I see my arrows. <laughs> it's not much good to anybody. If you were looking in, in the field, you could see areas where the tissue was pulling away, the mucus sheet was pulling away, revealing healthy t polyps underneath. Right, right. So this is actually not interesting. Normal, but like I said, we couldn't, we didn't figure that out until we did histology. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of photographed, marked it. It didn't quite look right like disease because it's not really progressive. Yeah. 
I couldn't figure it out, so we did the histology, and, and that's what it was. So on to the next one. Oh, boy. Okay, now I'm going to pick on someone else, Jane, so you can, you can rest. So everybody take a look here. This is the healthy. This is the lesion. This is already dead with sediment pretty thick on this. So take a look. I'm going to call on someone new. Is it tissue loss, growth anomaly, discoloration? Is it disease or not? And some descriptors. I don't know the rest of you, so I'm going to call someone at random. <laughs> Let's call. What about Stuart? You want to give it a try? Uh, yeah, I can give it a go. Um, yeah, why not? So, uh, just turn on the camera. There we go. Um, so, it seems yeah, it seems unlikely to be a growth anomaly. Um, the the fact that it's right up on the on the top of the coral makes me question whether it's bleaching related. Um, so it's a little bit harder to tell whether it's discolored or a tissue loss. Um, so that's true, and I'll give you that because you can't see. But if you field you were all of this white is tissue loss with sediment on it. So okay. Hold a tissue loss, so I I have to give that to you. It's okay. Not, not bleaching. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, with the tissue loss, there without knowing what else is around this coral, again, it's a little bit hard to tell um, whether it would be biological. Um, it's quite a large area, so it makes me think that it's probably more disease based, with what looks like a front spreading outwards. Um, based good. on the ruler, um, I'm thinking it's probably acute um and it seems like there's only one on the area so that would be focal very good okay so your thought processes were very good so what you picked up on was this is a huge area so the the potential for a uh soft coral brushing up in a circular pattern like that is almost impossible and once mm. you you rule out bleaching here that can't be a predator it's not tissue loss so it's got to be some sort of disease process. So very good. In terms of, it is focal, acute, subacute, chronic. Because there's such heavy sediment here, that means this is old. Mm -hmm. old loss. So that means it must have started here and has been very slowly progressing out. You can see that, well, you can't see, but if you were to look closely here, it would be a very thin line of skeleton without sediment on it. So this is actually a chronic tissue loss disease process. And this is what we saw in Belize, and it's on Sedastria, and we are just now having to, uh, getting the samples shipped from Florida to Hawaii for Terry work to do the histology to try and figure this out. Very good, thank you so much. Okay, okay next victim. This is the normal, this is the lesion. I think again, tissue loss, growth anomaly, discoloration, disease or not, and descriptors. I'm going to call on someone at random. Okay, let's pick on Dudley. Yes. Want to take a go at it, Dudley? Um, yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. Go for it. What do you see there, boy? Well, it's not a growth anomaly. Very good. It is discolored. Yes. Since I see a small ring, of um, colored coral 
of colored tissue right at the top. Yes. I am hesitant to say that it is tissue loss. Okay, good. And in fact, you see each of those little things right there? My, do you see what my arrow is pointing to? Um, no, I do not. Are you talking about the little fringes? Or? So, uh, um, if each of those little dots you see in that lighter area? Yes. Each of those dots is a polyp. So you're correct. The polyps are still in place there. So continue on. And since I know corals are genetically similar, if it was tissue loss, then they should have been, if it was a disease, then it should have been dead as well. But is this tissue loss if the polyps are present? Um, no, it's okay. just it's discoloration. Very good. And when a discoloration, when when the polyp, when the polyps lose their their zooxanthellae like that and turn white, what is that called? Isn't that bleaching? Very good. Okay. So now we've established that this is bleaching. So now the question is: Is this caused by your normal thermal stress, or is this perhaps a disease process? Okay, that is really difficult. <laughs> yeah, it is. Just walk us through your thought processes, right? Well, this is all a learning. Well, I didn't have um, bleaching in mind at first um, because I saw a little dot or a little white patch on the left, right, the right side of the photo. So I want to say it was a, it was caused by a disease because of of the separation between the large um, discolored patch and the light discolored and the small discolored patch on the right. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with disease rather than thermal stress. Okay, so very good. And one of the things that you should cue into is that there's a lot of non bleached and the, the area between the bleached and the non-bleached is very sharp. There's sharp lines delineating it, and it's not smooth, it's wavy. So that's a very distinct bleached patch, which is not consistent with thermal bleaching. And it's not on the top of the colony, you notice. It's on the edge in the lower side of the colony. Again, if it were bleaching, you'd expect to see that on the top of the colony. Very good. And is this focal, multifocal, or coalescing? I want to say multifocal because of the small white area on the right and the fact that it has a line of non-discolored um, core polyps. Okay. Not bad. That spot on the right, that small spot on the right is actually a worm tube. Okay. It's a worm tube, so it's a little... Uh, a, 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 Polychaete worm had actually made that, and it's not related to the larger bleached patch. So um, there's also, you can see, um, invasion by, look at the upper left part of the picture. You see how the, it's normal color, but it looks like it's in a circle? Yeah. That's a worm tube as well. Okay. So very good. So this would be parietes, because that's the host and focal bleaching or focal bleached patch. So very good. Okay. Great. <laughs> Moving on, I'll pick on someone else. Okay, here's your normal, here's your lesion. So think about type of lesion, disease or not, and descriptors. Who haven't I picked on? Hmm. There we go. Ah, 
Jatavia, you want to take that one? Dodley, go ahead and click off your uh, video. Click off your video. Here we go. Now, Jatavia, are you there? Don't be shy. Ha ha! I'm here. Okay, so give it a try here. Is it tissue loss, growth anomaly, or discoloration? It's definitely not a growth anomaly. Very good. Very good. And if you have questions, because I know the pictures are not always so good. <laughs> oh, because. Um, then I said that it's tissue loss, is it? So it is tissue loss. So that picture is not quite good enough, but it is not bleaching. It is definitely tissue loss. So is that biological or is that disease based upon that pattern of tissue loss that you're looking at on that coral? And to walk us through your thought processes because then other people learn what you're thinking about, you know. Like discoloration, um, it's quite jagged and you can see pieces peeling off. Okay, good, good. So, Is it disease? Is so in, or, in order to discriminate, remember between predation and disease, you look for the pattern. You know what your predators are out there on your reefs. So think about could any predators make this 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 mark? And then you look for evidence of progression. So is it does it look like it's progressing with algae coming in and moving in a in a direction? So those are the kind of the things you think about when you see a tissue loss lesion. Yeah. And then, see, so people predation as well. Is there a picture? From fireworms, as a fireworm predation. Okay, so very good. So, um, this is fireworm predation, and the way you can tell is there's no evidence progression, there's no algae coming in, and it's partial predation. There's just the tops here eaten, the top here eaten, the top here eaten. See, it's just that top and the rims of the polyps that are eaten, and so that would indeed be fireworm predation. Very good. Okay. So in summary, when you see something out on the reef, you, you got to take a look at it, figure out what type of lesion, do your field investigation. Is something rubbing up against the coral? Is there a fish there? Is there a snail there, et cetera? Then describe the lesion as we've outlined here. And then if indeed it is disease, you have your proper nomenclature. Okay, very good, guys. Okay, the very last section, which is, which is fairly short, is disease treatment consideration. So here what I'm going to do is present some of the information that people have been learning in um, Florida about the patterns of disease in the field and how that can help you decide which treatments are working better. Maybe some treatments work better on some corals, et cetera. So the first thing I'll talk about is work by Katie Eaton and Aaron Mueller at Moat. And I'm just, giving you the relevant parts, is they took a single diseased fragment here, and here's the lesion, and they sliced it up. So distance one is on the lesion, two is near the lesion, three is far away from the reason, four even further. And then what they did is they looked to see if they put each of these in its own aquaria, so it's no longer exposed to this disease or the diseased water in its own aquaria, will it eventually show up disease, okay? 
And what we see, distance one, percentage of fragments that develop the disease, of course, they all had it to start with. Two right next to it makes sense. But look at this, even three and four in their own aquaria develop disease. So disease showed up in these fragments that were no longer exposed. And if you look at average number of days for tissue loss to appear, um, looks about 13 days, 10 days, over 15 days. So it took a while for the pathogens to build up on those corals and for disease to show. So that is why we think that people need to do these retreatments. You treat this disease here, but the pathogen is already somewhere here, but not very common, and it's growing in abundance, and that's why you may need to retreat, and why these fire breaks may be effective, because if you treat it on the lesion and then put a fire break, say on D2, well, maybe by that time, disease will be stopped in it. Okay, so that's one bit of information explaining why we may need retreatments and fire breaks. This is a uh, work by um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They've done some phenomenal things, but they went out and they did disease. This is disease treatment. Okay, and these were all tagged or mapped colonies. And a couple of things come out. First off, you see that treatments differ, success differs by species and the number of times that you need to retreat that colony. So the colony treated once, you had to go back a second time, you had to go back a third time, you had to go back a fourth time, you had to go back a fifth time, etc. So if you look at this, you see for that example, the Sedastria, actually a large number of them only had to be treated once, but for Cavernosa less, not so many for the others too. So you see, you, you plan on retreatment, almost everybody has to retreat, doesn't matter what method you use, and look at your species and try to evaluate that based upon what other people have found. This is Brian Walker's uh, work. He's out there in Florida. Now what this is, these are corals, that tag corals that he's treated. The gray bars is the success of treatment using chlorinated epoxy. The black bars are the success using um, the antibiotic paste. So first off, if you just look at the chlorinated epoxy, you see that it was much more successful on Orbicella, not very successful on Montastria. So as we go about thinking about our treatments, we may end up doing a mixed model where we take multiple treatment methods out with this depending on what coral species. The other thing you wanna see is that when they switched to antibiotic treatments, it was a little more successful, but really not that much. So you gotta think, is the in antibiotics in the environment worth that three or four or 5% higher success rate? I don't know. And in fact, with Montastria, it wasn't really any more successful at all. Now in other species, it's, it's different. You see low success with the chlorinated epoxy, and high success with the antibiotics. In a case like that, you might say, huh, well maybe for this species, we gotta go with the big guns. The other thing that Brian found is that um, some colonies just are darn hard to treat. They're genetically more or less able to fight this disease. So this is the time frame from September 2018 to April 2020. In each of these LC120, LC015, those are all individual colonies across. And these are ones he treated, okay? He's treating them with antibiotics. And you see that if it has a darkened square in there, that they had to retreat it. And the darker the square, the higher number of lesions on that colony. And these were all large, larger colonies. He was only working on the large orbicellas there. And you see for the first, the ones in the blue, that they were treated and treated and treated and treated and just kept getting um, new lesions. So you gotta anticipate that. But for the ones down in the pink, they um, were treated and most of them only needed one more or maybe two treatments. So you gotta keep this in mind again, as you go through and figure out 
what methods are working for you, depending on which species in, et cetera. Some colonies, you're just very resistant to treatment and it has nothing to do with what you were using or how you did it. It wasn't you, it was them. So, you know, this comes to the end of my presentation because we are all together, I think, concerned about one thing, and that is protecting coral reefs worldwide. I don't care where you are in the world. And that takes both research, that takes management, and that takes protection. And once again, I just really want to uh, thank all of the volunteers that are going to be stepping up in Turks and Caicos to take care of the problem there and doing it in a proper manner. And so with that, I will finish and take any questions about either of those talks. Questions? I'm very excited to hear what you guys do, hear your success. There's always a learning curve. The first time you go out, you're not gonna be as successful as the second time you go out. It's, it's clumsy, it's difficult. So you gotta give yourself some time to figure it out there. Okay, Roddy, I see your hands up, go ahead. Hi, Greta. Um, thank you for all of that. Uh, my first question will be, um, if we're looking back to some of the mucus sheathing example that you gave when we went through um, our little quiz there, if you like. If I was to waft my hand and try and um, get some water current to brush across that surface, would I see some of that mucus to start to come away from the, the tissues? Depends on what stage that sheathing was, but in general, that stuff sticks pretty hard. Um, but what you would notice on that real sharp demarcation line, you, if you look closely, you'd see some of it starting to peel off a little bit. So when you send me your pictures, Roddy, I really zoom in to see if I can see tissue peeling. Um, and that's why all of you guys are gonna be volunteering for Roddy. It's critical that you take proper photographs, whole colony, reef shots, so we can see if there's anything else touching the colony, and on then close-ups of those lesions so we can really um, pull in and magnify those pictures. Because you will see, see the peeling on once you magnify the picture. Good question. Okay, Dudley? Um, Greta, I have two questions i'm gonna put in the in the chat because it's kind of lengthy okay and i kind of one second okay it's in the chat right now okay um let's see hold on chat I'm going to switch. Um, oh, yes. So Jane said she found it uh, useful to carry a plastic magnifying glass to look at those things. That's a good idea, Jane. Yes. Okay. Can a gram negative or gram positive uh, bacterial species? Wait. Uh, where the corals are known to fluoresce. Yes, they do fluoresce. Um, yes, some bacteria do fluoresce without dye or stain. Absolutely. Yes. The answer is yes. Number two, um, um, can you narrow it down by that? No, you would actually have, uh, uh it says, uh, can you narrow down the bacterial species, whether it's gram, gram positive or negative? by seeing if the fluorescent color of the infected tissue has been altered. So that won't help with that. Um, you would actually have to um, take some of the mucus off that coral and there's special gram stains that you can use on a slide, but not just from the, the shift in the tissue. Good questions. Good. So Next. thank you, Russia, for me as well. 